design and engineering, critical inquiry in design and technology use. And so it's really a campus-wide initiative that we're also um, hoping um, to expand a little bit beyond campus and get visibility sort of in and outside U of M. And so in fact, you know, this is accomplished by having amazing speakers like Dan Costley here today. So I'll briefly introduce Dan um, before we delve right into his talk. So Dan Costley is an associate professor in information science at Cornell University. And he does research around human-computer interactions and also particularly focused on social media. And so his predominant high-level research goal in this area is to build systems that leverage people's pre-existing behavior in digital media to improve individual well-being, but also community outcomes. And so in doing this, Dan studies how people use systems to understand themselves, but also their relationships better, and how our behavior is shaped both by other people and by the, by the systems that we are using themselves. So his talk today is entitled, If Ideas are Viruses, Personal Preferences of the Immune System. So please join me in welcoming Dan today. Thanks, Sonia. Thanks, everyone. Is this a perfectly loud teaching voice that will carry to the back of the room? Okay, cool. So today I'm going to talk about work that's different from the stuff I kind of made my bones on as an assistant professor. Right? I've been talking about this stuff about memory and reminiscence for a long time. This is the first time I've actually gotten to talk about some of this work that Amit Sharma, a PhD student that I worked with at Cornell, who's now at uh, a postdoc at MSR New York, he was kind of the lead driver on this work, so this is sort of my first chance to talk about it. So if I screw things up, please call me on it, especially if you know something about the domain. Uh, the high level point of this talk right, is about sharing things. And you can't give a talk about sharing things without showing a meme, so here you go. All right, so this is the drunk baby meme, right? And so people, people take these things and put a bunch of content on them, right? And so often when we talk about sharing things and sharing ideas in social media, we think about this. But in fact, social media are like built for sharing, right? Sharing music, sharing songs, sharing our preferences about books, sharing news, sharing movies, sharing URLs, sharing source code, right? <laughs> and these media, we see in all these media, we see the things that other people do, right? We see what they read, we see what they like, we see what they're thinking about. And, it, 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 and there's a kind of rhetoric around these media. Right? And this rhetoric is a rhetoric of virality, right? that things just spread, that in fact things just want to spread, right? that ideas are like, you know, Dawkins is saying, ideas are like genes and they want to spread, they want to go from place to place. Right? And if you could just figure out the mechanism by which things spread, you could create your own drunk baby meme and make sure that it got popular and famous <laughs> and you made lots of money, right, and everybody would be happy. Well, except for the drunk baby. Who's going to have to look at that picture for the rest of their life? But the, but the, the high level, the, one of the big things that this, this virality theme, right, one of the big metaphors of virality comes up is that there's sort of a, it, it puts the focus on spreading and senders and people who are infected. And so like Gladwell, when he talks about this stuff, right, he talks about in social networks, if you want something to spread, you need certain kinds of people. And so he's got this hypothesis in his book called The Tipping Point, where you need experts and well-connected people and persuaders, right? And if you only had those things, then you're much more likely to have your idea or innovation get out into the world, right? But it turns out that the same people who share some things that are wildly successful also share lots of things that are not successful, right? And I think this, this emphasis on like the important people in a network, right? Whether it's the influencers or mavens and connectors and salesmen, or whether if you're an epidemiology person, you're thinking about patient zero of the epidemic, sort of sort of misses an important point, which is that to actually get the thing to spread widely through a network, all these boring gray people who don't even deserve faces, they're just little <laughs> circles in this diagram, right? I got this diagram, not my diagram, I got this from a sort of illustration of, of, of stuff. But that those people matter too, 
and that by focusing on my thesis in this talk, the thing i'm going to try to convince you about for the next thirty five minutes or so is that those people matter that ideas are not viruses, they don't just spread. When I cough on you, you have limited choice about whether you're going to get my virus or not. But if I tell you something, you actually have a lot of choice about whether you're going to pay attention to it, care about it, and pass it on. And so these people, the huddled gray masses, have agency, they have preferences, and if you understand those things, right, maybe we can sort of have a better picture of how ideas and information spread in networks than if we just focus on trying to do the right magic okay. marketing to the right magic influencers. Okay, so that's the talk outline. We're gonna talk about the agency stuff and introduce the idea of preferences using a paper that Amit and I did for number 13 on social explanations. <coughs> and then we're gonna talk about how people, if people, actually influence each other through these news feed or these feeds of, of behavior in social media that's going to be published at CSCW 2016, right? So people who are going to CSCW, you can skip that talk. Uh, we'll talk about it. Let's skip that talk, because it'll be giving it, and he needs his exposure too. Um, right, so, okay. And then I'm going to end the talk with some semi-informed speculation. I'm hoping people who actually really know a lot about uh, diffusion and social networks, such as, as Dr. Romero, and I-10 are willing, and other people actually, are willing to throw in here, right? This is not just a Danco transmission model. I'd like to hear back questions you have and things that you think. So that's the stuff. That's the thing. Now, first um, study that I want to talk about. So basically, we're talking about two studies, right? I'm trying to avoid the temptation of talking about a million different things. The first study was rooted in this idea that we see these social explanations, right? 65,535 people like this, right? And we see this in places like Facebook and Google. This one's especially powerful because if you're the next person to like it, right, you sort of turn over the binary digit. Um, my car actually passed 111111 on the way over here. So, um, uh, or you might see things that say that certain people in your network like stuff, right? And so these are, this, is, this actually starts a very practical question. We see these things, they presumably influence our behavior. And so what Amit did, and Amit is a super creative experimentalist, it turns out, uh, decided that he would try to study the effects of these by looking at people's behavior on Facebook or on music. And so he decided to do a user study, a within subject site study, where we recruited people to come in, and we asked them, of, uh, we took all the likes of all the things in their social network, and we asked them, we focused on music, and we asked people, do you know this artist or not, right? And so for some of them said, we don't really know very much about this artist. And we did this because we wanted to ask people and use social explanations on things that people didn't have very much of an opinion about already, right? So we tried to get people to tell us, hey, here are artists I don't know much about. And then we showed them 30 of those. We showed the album cover, the artist name, so a minimal content explanation, which actually is often what you see in these kind of sharing networks, right? You see a feed of stuff that just has like a picture and an artist's name. And then a social explanation, ran mostly randomly selected. We tried to actually not lie when we were creating social explanations. So there's a little bit of non-randomness, uh, the details of what's in the paper. But we showed them this and when we asked them, how likely are you to check out the artist? And we asked them to rate it on a zero to 10 likelihood scale. Okay, yes. What's the social explanation? Uh, so yes. I will show you four examples. Um, so when we were choosing these strategies, we were trying to pick ones that are actually used in practice, and we were trying to think about what sort of actual social psychological mechanisms they might might sort of tickle, right? So, so the first one is this overall popularity one that you see sometimes uh, that, that, that is kind of really just social proof, right? The idea that if other people do something, you should do it too, right? Um, and so one of the social explanations is based on the number of people who like it. Another one was ba was the same thing, but in your friends group. So kind of social proof, but also crossed with a notion of conformity, that peer pressure and the people who are immediately around you in your social network exert more influence on what you do. And so the idea was maybe this one would actually be more effective in some sense, right? For, it's not clear what effective means. In this case, probably it means encouraging you to try out the IDS door even better, make a good decision about the artist. But we'll get back to that. 
Um, the third kind was where we showed exactly one name, right? You could show more names here, right? You could show two names or three names. And in fact, Facebook did a controlled study. You know, Facebook has some advantages over us and that they have like a, a million user user base and they can do stuff from the inside. So we had to go on the cheap. And so we just did one name. Um, and we picked either a random friend from the network or a good friend in the sense that it was someone who you've interacted with a fair amount recently. That's not a great measure of tie string, but it ties well to Gilbert and Kara Helios' stuff around estimating tie strength in Facebook. Interaction frequency was one of the reasonably useful predictors in that model. <coughs> and then finally, we had a version that combined the juicy goodness of good friend with the kind of social pressure of conformity that showed both count and the name. And again, this is one that you commonly see in places like this one. Okay. So here are our social explanations. We showed people six each of these, right? So, um, so um, what happened, right? Well, we asked them to rate, and it turns out that you see, on average, differences. So, uh, overall popularity, kind of in the middle, a randomly named friend, actually least useful of all, but a good friend, <coughs> especially with some signal that it's valuable in your in your network, most powerful on average, right? Now, one of the big points about work like this is that it average isn't always really sort of telling you what's going on, right? And so, so it turns out that people actually spend a lot of time. So, so for instance, why is random friends lead to low ratings and why does good friend lead to high ratings? Well, one reason is because it matters who you show, right? If you're on Facebook and you're trying to decide which friend to show from the network, don't pick someone randomly. Pick someone the person knows, right? Because then they know their tastes. And if they know their tastes, they can use that to make a better decision than if you just show someone random, right? It turns out that showing crowd information kind of depends on the person. If people believe that their friends or that the world, right, are useful sources for them, right? So people are different in this. If you believe that your friend's tastes represent you, then it's actually a pretty useful, good idea to show the number, right? If you're one of those people who are like, my friends are all into this bullshit music, I'm so much more sophisticated than them, their tastes are dumb and I'm really smart, showing them, right, some, some, some amount of, of friends who like the item actually might be not just non-useful, but actually encourage you not to look at the item, right? Same thing with if you show a friend with the tastes, with, and you know your tastes don't agree with that particular friend, you can say, oh man, that album cover looks like something that an 18 year old would use, and in fact, this is one of those random 18 year old students who friended me on Facebook and my network, I know I'm not gonna like this song, right? And so people, you know, doing a little bit of smart work to think about, you know, whether your, 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 your recognition is actually gonna be useful to the person, and in general, it turns out that people are more or less willing, on average, to use explanation information. So like about a fifth of our people you know, describe themselves as absolutely ignoring <coughs> social explanation. About a third uh, thought it was extremely helpful in making the decision, and about two-fifths thought it was at least kind of useful help for helping them think about things. And we actually, if you look at the patterns of ratings that people gave across all the explanations, and you cluster them, you actually kind of see this really quite nicely. You see a group of people who basically are like, no, 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 right? And a few yeses. There are some people who seem to be open to trying new music, and there are some people who are kind of a mixture model of this. And Amit actually does a bunch of modeling work in the paper that's not the main point of today's talk about user preferences and agency. So I'm going to leave that out. But if people want to see sort of a little more mathematical formalization of that, it's over in the dub 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 paper. The one thing that should uh, astute readers of this talk may have noticed that, in fact, uh, a lot of these ratings are really low. Right? On a scale of 0 to 10, how likely are you to try this artist? The average is. 2.4, right? So what we <coughs> inferred about this is that social explanations actually have this very secondary effect. That even the distribution of willingness between the absolute worst strategy and the absolute best strategy 
don't look all that different. Mostly no, a few more yeses. And in fact, people used kind of content, right? Even the limited content stuff that they could see from a picture of the artist or an album name, right? If I say Megadeth, right? Some of you are like, yeah. And some of you are like, not for me, right? And so people, and, 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 and our belief, right, is that these kind of internal personal preferences, right, the ways that people sort of think about things and the ways they react to things actually kind of dominate the effect of social explanations or influence. Yes, sir. Um, kind of extrapolation of the same idea would be if I have, would you like to see certain albums which I have already liked? And say that people in your friend circle who have like these also like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so there's a, there's definitely a recommender system story that you could play here, right? And basically, you're describing do a good recommender system, and I think that's right. Here, we were really focusing on the effect of the explanation itself. So we didn't want to try to pick ones that people were particularly more or less suited for. It is interesting to think about like the relative value of a recommender system, right? So the dirty, so I've done a lot of recommender systems research. The dirty little secret of recommender systems research is that you know they're not actually that much better than good average adjusted ratings of things, right? They give you some accuracy boost, right? And they have lots of other pos positive or positive impacts on people. They can help you like understand why a system is recommending things to you. And in fact, social explanations are one of the ways that recommender systems try to convince you that they're doing right things. So I think that would be cool. That's just not what we were doing here. But it's a good point. Right. Okay. One thing I do want to point out here is that um, these social explanations, right? after people do some rating and how willing they are to look at the item, this is actually based on a, we did a, we did a study way back in 2003 in which we showed people in a recommender system, we manipulated the predicted rating that we would sh that, that, that people had, right? We artificially made it higher or lower, right? So you're a, you're a marketer in a company trying to get people to buy something that they might not otherwise. And so we actually manipulated those things, right? And in fact, it turns out if you show, if I show you what the system thinks that you're gonna rate it, right? Um, it'll actually, on average, change your ratings a little bit in the direction of what we showed you, right? In the moment, right? It wasn't clear whether that would last, right? Like it might just be that in the context, the system had basically anchored your rating to use a behavioral econ term, right? Uh, oh, of course it's for. In the same way that I would say, hey, didn't you love The Martian, right? And now if you say, no, I actually, I hated it. You're a weirdo social freak, right? Because <laughs> I've been trying to sort of set some expectations about what you should have. And so we were curious what would happen down the road, right? Would these things be useful and would the effect last? And so what Amit did was he brought people back three days later and he actually played several of the artists that they had rated. And he asked them at this time to rate, right? He's like, listen to samples from this artist and tell us how much you actually liked the thing, right? And this, which looks kind of like a demented bingo chart, Right, there's chips everywhere, is the correlation of the rating of how much they actually liked it after they listened to it, normalized to their average rating, versus the amount they thought they would like it based on the explanation. It turns out the correlation is approximately zero, meaning explanations have no value at all for helping people make decisions. Before they rated it, did you show them what they had originally No, said? we didn't. If had we done that, right, had we reminded them, oh, you might, you said you might like this, I bet the answer would have been different in the short term, right? And this is, and this is a question, right? As a, as a kind of a designer, as a recommender systems person, you have a choice about how much and when you put information out there to sort of affect people's decision making, right? And so that's, that's one of the things that we wanted to get. Okay, so I'm approximately 20 minutes in, counting introduction, and this is good, because I mean, I'm almost halfway through the talk, and I'm shooting for 40 minutes, so we have lots of time for questions and, and snide comments from you guys. And so, but I do want to sort of summarize this part of the talk, right? Okay. High level takeaways, different explanations, on average, different power, right? Good friends are more useful than cows, which are, you know, well, more useful probably in the sense that people talked about them as being useful. It's less clear how to interpret whether rating yourself is more likely to see it, especially if it didn't help you. It's unclear whether that's useful for the user. It's useful for a company that wants to get people 
right? It's a different kind of use. Um, this varies, right? People are differently susceptible in a number of ways. In general, some people are more or less willing to take explanations based on particular strategies. Some people found group versus individual ones more or less effective. And to particular data, right? The particular person actually really matters. These are all things that you could, in principle, model and learn and manipulate if you're a recommender systems designer. Okay. The third thing, right, which goes back to our high-level claim, is that social influence is a second-order effect. The other cognitive things, which we think include users' preferences, and which I'm hoping to convince you of in part two of the talk, dominate, right? That actually despite all this rhetoric about influencers and the power of friends, in fact, people mostly weren't moved by that very much in this study. Um, and then finally, we found that these social explanations might not actually be helpful, and there's actually a pretty big design opportunity around building better social explanations, or better explanations in general that help people make better decisions. Right. Okay. So that's part one of the talk, and I traditionally stop between parts of a talk for questions, so I'm going to pause and let you think of questions for 15 seconds and cover anything that come up. I'm actually going to let people think for a few seconds. I don't think. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see what Fair I say later. Well, I actually saw Daniel's <laughs> hand first, so youth before beauty. So um, <laughs> um, so, so you didn't actually try to get, uh, so like to tell them this person who we think is in some ways influential likes this, therefore you may like it. You just can either choose a random or someone who has who has a strong tie, right? Yes. So then they, this could play out differently if you actually tried to get the person right. who you know is an influential. Right. So so there's sort of a sixty-four thousand dollar question, which is can you model what it means to be an influential, right? And there's actually a paper in 2010 by Budak et al. that took the Mavens connectors and salesman thing and really try to mathematically formulate what it meant to be a connector mathemat uh, mathematician, not influential, uh, um, a maven, a connector, a salesman, right? And see whether having people who had those properties early in a cascade predicted the cascade. And there was some information there, right? But uh, I'll show you a slide at the end where I cast a lot of doubt on whether that's really happening, right? But I agree. Had you been able to think of who are the most influential people in the in your network, in your friend network, right? You might have gotten different things. And if you had told them that this was an influential person, it might have had a, you know, going back to what Nicole said, might have had a stronger effect still. Right. Uh, uh, Cliff, do you want to see the floor or do you want to go ahead and go since you were in order? I'll go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a lot of this is dependent on the idea that uh, preferences are static, right? So uh -huh. You know, it doesn't affect because you have yeah. a large sample, but how much do you think is this kind of external influence over preference versus my internal preferences change over time or even by minute, right? Or that, because right. identity is not individualized or, or kind of solid in that unit. So preferences may be attached to individual parts of identity as opposed to attached to some kind of like overarching framework. So yeah. I, love, I love Taylor Swift in the mornings because it you know gets me to stop crying into the year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. I might like something else in the afternoon. Yes, and something else entirely at night, right. yes. Um, so a couple of thoughts on that. One of the things that we found actually in an earlier study that, that a, a 2011 social come around <coughs> how white people liked is that there's a lot kind of a sort of identity management and privacy management as well going on with liking in social networks, just as with other kinds of self-disclosure, right? You might not want to admit that you like the rescuers very much, right? It's a small, small kids movie from like 1982 that I really still like in part because of Judge Dolores' voice as the, the lead female mouse. Um, <laughs> yes, I was in love with the mouse when I was 12, and I will freely admit that in front of a group. Um, the, <laughs> make it that way you will. But this idea that, that that, 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 that you're doing some identity work through what you like and don't like in public situations like this is actually true and important, I think. I think, I think the long-term versus short-term preference change was actually less important here because we weren't computing recommendations based on the older likes. So like we were just asking for stuff that people didn't have an opinion for, right? If we were doing that, right, then I, I do think that thinking about what's 
either what's recent or what's most important. Like my recommender systems algorithms parts are convinced that if you could just figure out which of your ratings were more important towards your identity than others, right? Like my, my rating for you know Star Trek doesn't matter, but my rating for Star Wars tells me who I am, tells, tells me who <laughs> you are as a person, right? Um, that, 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 that might actually be more effective, but I was, and I played with it around with it a little bit, I was never able to sort of formulate it in a useful algorithmic way. Is that a useful answer? Yeah, it is. Thanks. Okay. And then we'll move on after this one. Uh, I was curious on the, the particular friend side of things. Uh -huh. um, after the study, did you happen to ask, or, or later on in the study, do you happen to ask those uh, individuals you're uh, working with uh, whether they, how close of a friend they considered that person that they were displayed? We did not actually do tie strength measures. We did another study where we, uh, it's in CSD 2015, where we asked people how close of the friend, when we were asking people to share information explicitly and directly at each other, right? Because we thought that that would matter. But here we didn't have that, so we didn't have a good evaluation of that. That would be, that would be useful, right? And it was just a sort of experimental oversight. Yeah. All right. So, part two. So part two came out of uh, sort of very broadly uh, uh, an idea that, that you might learn about your friends through using recommender systems and feeds and social networks, right? And uh, the, the big picture of Mitt, right? Mitt walked into my office as a first year student and said, what if recommender systems were built for networks instead of individuals on Amazon? What would be different, right? And that was, as soon as he asked that question, I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. Because it was such a different way of looking at it. And so we were thinking about sort of understanding friends' behavior, right, by seeing what they do. And of course, the natural next step is once you see that your friends are doing things, maybe, maybe you decide, right, that, that you should do them too, right? And whether it's because it's something that you already like and it reminds you that you like it, or whether it's something you hadn't thought about, but because Nolf except me, right, liked it, that suddenly you decided that it's worth trying out, but you might be influenced by seeing these feeds, right? And if you think about it, right, how long, you know, you click on URLs in your Facebook news feed. I mean, I realize some of you are too hip to use Facebook, but people like me and Cliff, right, we still use Facebook. <laughs> and, 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 and when we click on, I even click on some of Cliff's URLs, right? <laughs> I, I, then, I then kind of wash my hands and stuff, but I'm sorry, Cliff. I'm, it's so, it's, I'm, I'm glad you're willing to, to take this abuse. Um, please, give, please give it back later. Um, but but you, you, you know, the, and, and the rhetoric, right, is that information cascades this way. If an information is going to cascade in this way, it probably has to show up in my feed and I have to click on it, causing it to show up in someone else's feed. And if there's an explicit sharing step, I actually have to do that. And that has to happen lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of times for a cascade to go very far. And in fact, um, most of the time it doesn't, right? Most drunk baby memes suck and never get spread, right? And so the question is, you know, what influence do we actually get by seeing what's in our feed? Because, you know, we do tend to do things that our friends do, right? Now, sociologists have talked about this for a long time, and they phrase this in terms of homophily and influence and this incredibly difficult problem of trying to tell them apart. We're not going to claim in this part of the talk that we have told them apart. We're going to claim that we have a slightly useful process for helping to make a little progress on tell them, telling them apart. But the basic idea is that if I do something, right, that I see Jacob do, is it because he convinced me, or is it because we both like Wikipedia? Right? He posts a Wikipedia link. Have I been influenced to see it, or do we just both have the underlying preferences for it? Right? And when a lot of studies that, that try to address this question look at basically, do I copy something you did in your feed, joining a group, right? There's a lot of sort of work in the mid to late 2000s about, you know, K exposure, Lars Baxter and now, right? Do I join the groups that my friends do? Do I edit the Wikipedia articles that people I talk to edit, right? <laughs> um, and they just look at overlap. And if you don't think about the underlying probability that you would have done something anyways, right? Then you run the risk of overcounting how much other people are influencing you, right? If I'm gonna listen to those three songs anyway, seeing them in my feed is at best an incredibly weak notion of influence. So, 
so what we and there's other things that can happen too, and i want to focus on this. but you know there could be overlap, because you know the martian came out, and you know all of our friends told us to go see it, and so we saw it even though we weren't planning to. and all of a sudden you know i saw it thirty minutes before daniel did, so i must have influenced him. um and so and so teasing these things apart is brutal. right? you need right? you need a very principled definition of what you mean by influence, and you need a mechanism, both ideally both a theoretical and a practical interface-oriented one, by which you think influence is conveyed. And so here, influence means clicking on something you wouldn't have otherwise clicked on, probably, based on your preferences. And the mechanism is seeing it and becoming aware of it through your feed. This is not the only way influence propagates in social media, far from it. But it's a common way. It's the way that corresponds to cascades. And although I don't want to explain all of the influence, I actually think that's impossible right? in sort of 40 minutes. But I do want to explain some aspect of influence really well. Right? That's what this is about, trying to get to really clean definitions. Um, and the high level tool that we're going to attack this problem with is recommender systems. I'm going back to my roots. Right? Because when you think about the fusion models, right, they usually don't think about the fact that an item that's spreading now is not the first item that's ever spread through this network. That in fact, you have a rich history of people doing things, and in principle, you know something that people like. right? And you could actually think a little bit about my affinity for things that are likely to spread through a network. right? Even things you don't have a lot of ratings Right? a lot of information about, you know who is starting them, you know which friend's feed it's appearing in, and you know how similar you are to them. Right? So you can make maybe a principled guess. Okay? Further, <coughs> this data is actually really available. Right? So there was a paper that was actually pretty inspiring by Shannon et al, who said, well, let's control for homophily by looking at demographics. Right? A very sort of marketing, business-oriented way to think about this. Right? Oh, well, they're both 18 to 24, so they must like <laughs> whatever the hell 18 to 24 year olds like these days. Um, right? And so, but you could, if you had that information, you could actually do, you know, essentially propensity matching. Right? You say, okay, these people are kind of the same in this interesting way. And if you control for that, right, then you can look at the difference and say, well, that's probably influence, right? And so what we realize is two things. One is that instead of demographic stuff that we might not be able to see, we can just look at what people do. The most direct indicator of your preferences, right, modulo things like identity management and stuff, is your actions, recommender systems, right? And so you can imagine a network with you and your friends and similarity ratings, how similar you are to them, right? Here's a, here's a friend whose taste I used to decide not what to do, right? And I can actually go off into the network and I can go find a whole bunch of non-friends who are exactly as similar to me as my friends. Right? So I'm going to create a fake network right, of people whose preferences are as similar to me as my friends. Right? And further, I can make a fake invisible feed of their actions that looks just like my friend's feed. Right? Now, if I do something that's in my fake invisible feed, right, that's not because I was influenced by these people. Because the feed is fake and invisible, I can't actually see it and be influenced by it. Instead, what this feed represents is an underlying distribution of actions that people who are like my social network are taking. Right? And so actions that I take that match that are probably not influenced. Right? And so sort of super simply, what you do is you create this network, right, based on the, so for the purpose of this paper, we divided the network at a fixed point in time, right? There are lots of problems with that assumption, right? Ch tastes change over time. Early in your lifespan, you might be much more influenceable than later in your lifespan. But, you know, for tractability, we did this, right? Compute these fake networks at T, and then construct feeds, right, that, that contain the, the friends actions, right? And in particular, the last M actions, because another thing that's true is that you don't normally spend time sort of reading 90,000 posts back in a Facebook feed, right? You have some limited attention budget, right? And so you just look at recent activity that happened around your action. That's the activity that might have influenced you for 
this action. Now, this doesn't align with like sort of you know threshold models of information spread, right? This is much more an independent cascade model that sort of explicitly accounts for individuals' attention. Uh, attention. But what you basically do then is you count how much overlaps with your friends, how much overlaps with your strangers, your similar strangers, and then in a feat of ultimate mathematical sophistication, you subtract, <laughs> right? Uh, and so the difference in behavior between what you might have done anyways and what you actually do with your friends, right, is an estimate of influence. Now, of course, the astute among you would realize that this could be less than zero, right? That actually could have meaning, right? You could be anti-doing things that you see other people. You could be counterculture, right? Um, uh, and in some weird way, you could account that as a kind of influence. But for the purposes of our analysis, we said if you do, if you don't do anything more than you would have done on your own based on your friends, that, that we're going to take you as not influence. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. So. I mean, went off and grabbed a whole bunch of data from Last.fm, both listens and love data, right? Um, he's made this data set available. It'll be published with the paper, right? So people who want kind of a pretty large network data set with listening and loving behavior uh, will be able to download it, assuming that Last.fm doesn't decide. We don't think it violates their terms of service, but yeah. Okay, but anyways. <laughs> So, so we took this data, we decided to fix the size of the feed at 10 items, right? Which is actually more than you would normally see in last.fm. I think the widgets normally show three. We tried different values of M. We tried different values of T. We tried different tolerances for how similar that non-friends network had to be to you, right? And this, uh, the findings are pretty robust. Um, but, and, and then what we did, right, to first validate it was that we generated a fictional world using the last.fm data. We took the data up before T, right, as is to compute the similarities. And then after T, um, we assume that people either choose randomly songs randomly weighted by popularity, a way to sort of account for external exposure. Now it turns out that you know that process doesn't generate very much observed overlap anyways. And then when you sort of factor out the overlap that might have happened because of your preferences, you get zero, right? Another one. Choose items after T, re-simulate the data set, right? Exactly as many actions with exactly the same number of timestamps, but based on something that one of the most similar users in the network did to you, right? Uh, this is different from constructing a network that's the friends who are as similar as your real neighbors. We want us to really represent our best guess as to what their preferences were, right? Um, and it turns out that if you do this, and you do the naive measure, it looks like there's some non-trivial amount of influence. When you account for underlying preferences, there's essentially zero, right? It wouldn't, as it should be, because you're not looking at your friend's behavior at all, right? If you're looking at your friend's behavior, right, it looks like you overlap with them a lot, and you do, and if there's some mixture model where you're influenced some of the time and not most of the time, it looks like there's more influence than there really is. This should be 0.1 in a 10 to 90 thing, right? So we've got this process that does a pretty good job, apparently, of filtering out your underlying preferences. Okay, that's synthetic data. Drum roll, please. All right, enough drum roll. Uh, so, okay, so the real data. On both the listens and the logs, we find that if you just look at the friends overlap, you get an estimate that's a lot higher, three to four hundred percent higher than if you factor out. Right? So this implies at a high level that any study that has not sort of thought about this is overestimating the right? And it's possible that this is just a last.fm phenomenon. So we got more data sets, <laughs> right? <laughs> data sets that were out there on um, Goodreads, Flickster, and Flickr, right? All of these have this property that you see a feed of your friend's actions in approximately reverse chronological order. Flickster's not like that anymore, but when the data set was collected by Jamali and Esther, it was, right? And so this procedure, you can actually, it's not specific to last.fm, it's anything where you have a network, time-stamped activity, and a more or less re reverse chronological feed, right? If Facebook's messing with your feed, you can't use this, this procedure very well, right? You have to 
either reverse engineer the feed or get data about what was actually shown. But it still applies to a lot of real social context. And if you look at it, you see, oh, right? Well, you see a couple of things. The first thing you see is that it always overestimates. Sometimes not by much. This is Flickr. Sometimes by a lot. This is Flickster. And we think that the differences, right? This is actually another reason why we wanted to get multiple data sets. It's because I'm deeply suspicious of papers that look at one data set and claim they understand the world, right? Wikipedia is not collaboration. Twitter is not information sharing. Facebook is not social networking. Take that back. <laughs> so, you clearly saw that coming. Uh, no, Cliff and I do not like communicate before talks. Planned comments. Um, it just happens. The magic just happens, uh, right? But so, so the high level, right, is that this procedure is actually appears to be really important if you want to think a little more carefully about influence, right? We think that these differences are in part because of the shape of the network, right? We'll see an example at the very end where the fact that Twitter follow, right, the number of Twitter followers is much higher and steeper exponentially than in other networks. Twitter influencers seem to be more visible there than other, other networks. But like in Flickr, the feed is like your dominant interface element when you're interacting with your friends. You're looking through your friends' photos, right? In Last.fm, you've got this widget that's showing a feed, but you might not even be paying attention to it because People are listening to it in the background, and a lot of your songs are sort of autoplay selected, right? And so in the paper, we actually talk about some of the interface factors and user goal factors that might explain why things are different. The high level point here, they're really different. Look at it in more than one context. Okay. That's part two. Yes, sir. Why is it important to differentiate between friends overlapping? Okay. That's an excellent question. So from a kind of intellectual standpoint, right? This is this is the long-standing debate in sociology. Why is it that friends appear to have correlated actions, right? And understanding the processes by which that happens are actually sort of really important to sociologists. From a practical point of view, understanding whether you're actually influencing people when you make interface changes might be really useful for like A-B testing kinds of things. Right? Now, it might not matter. It might not matter why. If you're a company and your goal is to get people to click on you know, extravagant looking headlines, you might not care why people are clicking on them as long as they click that button. But especially if your goals, if you have goals around moving particular information around and understanding why it's moving around, right? it might direct your marketing efforts. It might direct your interface design efforts. It might direct your algorithmic efforts to understand that. Is that a useful answer? Okay. Okay. So, there's actually hardly any, I, I'll, I'll take some questions now if you want, although there's actually not very much uninformed, uninformed speculation. I can finish up in like three or four minutes, I think, if you, and then we can do all the questions at the end. Your call. Anybody with kind of, I remember Ron Burke calling out Sarah Kiesler to talk once Sarah had a question. He's like, Ron, Ron's like, Sarah, you know, it looks like she needs to go to the bathroom, right? Ask this question, <laughs> right? And so, so, so if anybody has burning questions, Burning, that's different. <laughs> All right. Okay. So here's here's one claim that you could make based on these data. If you look at this, all of them, the percentage of my actions are actually explained by influence is well under one percent. Right. One sort of naive reading of this is that influence is overrated. It doesn't matter. It's all bullshit. Call off the influencers. Right. Let people. Let the dogs run wild. Now, I don't think that's actually what's going on, right? Remember, we had this assumption that time is fixed, and we looked at people relatively late in their lives. My guess is that there's more influence in the world, both through feeds and through other mechanisms, right? Uh, directed sharing, like Michael Bernstein suggests, right? Algorithmic filtering, recommender systems probably influence you in indirect ways through other people's behavior. But, right, but sort of think carefully about how much influence is really going on. And for, yes? So go back to this All right, I will attempt to do that. So maybe I'm missing something here, but don't these different data sets differ in terms of general population overlaps? How do you mean? Well, in, in Flixster, general population overlaps has more agreement over what communities they really like. Ah, right. That's, quite, that's a clever thought. I had not thought of that one. Right, that actually, Popular, okay, 
So then the question, right, so then, then one way to frame that question is, is it that you know, we're undercounting influence and actually people are influencing each other? Or is it just that there's like this sort of external influence thing, which would also be- More advertising influence. Yeah, yeah. No, and, I, and we actually think, we speculate about that a little bit, right? There are domains where, so like in Flickster, there's much more advertising external stuff. Flickr, right, it's much more uh, endogenous to the network. Photos are mostly not shared in other places. Same with hashtags and Twitter, right? Although now you see this in commercials that are trying to look very 2000. <laughs> but um, but but the, uh, I, I say 2010 like it's a bad thing. It's only five years ago. It's like <laughs> life. Um, it's practical yesterday. But 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 you know when things are endogenous, right? External influence I think becomes less of a factor, and what other people do probably becomes more important. Right. Yeah, so that's that's a good. Point. Is that fair? Okay. All right. But another thing though, influence like I hinted at, not very well specified, right? You need to have good definitions of what you're actually talking about. The better definitions you have, the less likely you are to make mistakes about what is influence, right? And the better we'll be able to sort of, like we don't just say, you know, social psychologists don't just say influence, right? And behavioral economists don't just say cognitive biases, right? They break this down into lots of specific things that operate in different contexts in different ways. Instead of talking about making things go viral, talking about, you know, making things go a little viral through this mechanism feels more appropriate and more doable. I think that using these insights can also help you build better diffusion models, right? Uh, diffusion models, uh, threshold and cascade models sort of average across populations usually about things like how infectious you are, which basically corresponds to how many people you connect to on Twitter, right? Or how much people listen to you on Twitter and how susceptible you are, right? Which would be on average those curves we saw about how, how willing people were to try something based on a minimal social explanation, right? If you actually sort of model those things on a person by person basis, which now you can do because you can see people's behavior, you probably get better diffusion models and maybe better recommender systems. And then finally, um, I think uh, here's a, this is, this is work that's sort of still in the cauldron. We computed, based on a paper by Cheng et al, we computed a whole bunch of features about people's social networks, uh, especially the people who were the first few people to adopt an item, right? Attributes of those people, activity attributes reach, uh, attributes about how fast those early adoptions happen. And the question is, can you predict what's going to be sort of the winner in the end, right? And in this formulation of the problem, your task is simple. Among all items that had at least five likes or adoptions or listens, right, whatever the domain is, right, can you predict in the end which ones are going to be in the upper half, right? So this is not even like finding the top five things, right? This is like that you're going to market or feature on your website. This is like YouTube trying to guess which videos, right, it should put in its recommendations, except it, it, in, in the medium problem, it gets to show like 52 trillion videos, right? You really, even in that version of the problem, which is not actually that practically useful, it turns out that almost all of the signal and almost all of the data sets comes from knowing how fast things get adopted, right? Properties of the people who adopted them, basically not really better than that. This is different in Twitter. It looks like it looks like understanding some properties of resharers and their networks actually have more predictive power in guessing whether something was going to be more popular than average in the end. And I think, but I cannot prove, that this is because in Twitter, right, the distribution of network sizes is so much bigger than in the other sites, right? In Flickr, you're lucky if you have 100 followers, right? In last.fm, maybe only 500 people will get you. In Twitter, if you're famous, like 50 million people might follow you. Well, 5 million people might follow you. And so we're still trying to understand this. But it really kind of, for me, says, puts kind of a nail, well, not a nail, it puts a tiny staple in the coffin of this idea of <laughs> influencers, right? That it's unclear that focusing just on the properties of who's sharing is the thing to do. That thinking about the things that the people who receive, I found this 
very beautiful but slightly fatalistic diagram by this guy, Dan Zarella, while I was prepping this talk. He's saying, yeah, you might have 10,000 followers, but not all of them are going to see it, not all of them are going to pay attention to it, and then not all of them are going to care enough about it to do anything about it. And so really in the end, right, your influence is some tiny fraction probably of what you think it is. I'm so, and this, you know, Cliff, I remember Cliff at HCIC, I think 2011 or something, was preparing a talk on attention, right? I really liked that idea. I think paying attention to the attention side of this rather than the spreader side is a giant, big, potential, throbbing win for some of you to go off and execute on. I wish you'd been on my NSF panel. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. Uh, and, I, and I couldn't tell you if I was. Yeah. Um, all right, I'll just now stop working. <laughs> Fortunately, the talk is essentially, oh, oh wait, maybe, maybe, the, maybe everything crashed. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right, cool. So I think that, that putting these things together is a, a path to victory, right? Diffusion models that understand preferences, recommender systems that understand how social dynamics work, both big wins. And I'm just going to skip to the last slide, which has a bonus meme, right? Uh, I hope that you guys had fun with this talk and that it caused you to think some interesting things relevant to your own lives and it wasn't just me going blah, 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 blah for 15 minutes. I want to thank Amit, Nirvana, Michael, Yuan, Me Too, Cornell, Yahoo, and NSF for helping make this happen. I want to thank you guys for listening. Questions? <laughs> or snide comments. I, I did say I was going to make room for snide comments. So. Yes, sir. Is this a question or a snide comment? Question. Okay. <laughs> so, so how long was this study taken place for? Like, how was how long was the study? So the second, the, the second study, the first one. The first one, uh, we collect, we conducted it over the course of maybe a month or so. It took a little while to recruit people, so people were coming in. Why, why do you ask? Uh, so I was wondering if it was a longer term study. People change places and they change mm -hmm. friends. Yeah, I think that's something that recognizes. You know, this goes back to this idea of tastes changing too and networks changing. Right? In fact, in the second study, we assume a static network, right? right? We know that's not true. Now, we didn't have network timestamp data, so we couldn't do anything about it, right? Or anything sort of principal, right? We couldn't guess based on activities and stuff. But, but I didn't want to just guess, right? I would rather own up to our limitations. Yes, thinking about time, actually, that's one of my other pet hobby horses, apart from using multiple data sets and definitions and methods, right? I think looking at time in the evolution of communities, right? We didn't used to do this because we never had the data and we didn't have communities that had lived long enough. Wikipedia's turned 15, Facebook's turned 10, Twitter's eight. We actually could model in meaningful ways change over time that might really matter. Yes. So I'm wondering if you've thought about whether, like, how much influence do you actually need uh, going on for the influential theory to actually hold? Like, you could imagine that even if there's just a little bit, uh, then it matters uh, early on yeah. whether you're influential or not, and then homophily can just yeah. take you all the yeah. way. Yeah. So, so there's a question about whether there's some phase change, right? Which is kind of what the uh, adoption curve models and what all sort of implicitly assume, or whether it really needs to be sort of this slowly building to tsunami over time, right? Even there, there's this, this idea that a shock caused things to happen in the first place. I don't know. I think it's an interesting question. Haven't tried to attack it yet, right? Thank you. I know this is a horrible thing to say to a computer scientist, but it feels like you're building a theory, right? And that theory is a theory of choice. You're talking about why do people make decisions to consume what they are. I wonder if you guys had a chance to model basically the full aspects of this, because you've heard kind of yep. three ideas, yep. right? You're yep. talking about influencers. Yep. Carl's saying, well, maybe there's topic dependencies, yep. right? We yep. make choices yep. where it matters more yep. for some things versus others. I'm saying it's an internal yep. state, maybe yep. I'm emotional or something like that. So have you guys mapped out kind of a larger model for this? You guys like focus on one construct for your entire careers and you're like, oh yeah, we got it, man, influence, right? And you just told me to build a model that has six or seven things going on. Uh, but yes, I have, and I'm not, I'm kidding, right? I mean, the people, the people do a lot of con concepts along the way. I think that that's, that's what I tried to talk about in doing this, right? And I think he wisely said no. Right? I think the long term, 
right, is that those diffusion, those threshold diffusion models, which usually have just a couple of parameters, right? One way to build a mathematical formulation of that model is to have those parameters informed by some of these other kind of sub-theories, right, that help shape what the parameters look like. That's a kind of model that I think would be really interesting. I mean, we actually even have data, right, the CCW paper has, has a sort of high-level model for how people make decisions to share. Here's a hint. It's all about their own personal <coughs> preferences, not about their networks, but even though people say they're thinking about other people, right? But no, I actually think that's, you know, in worlds where faculty had infinite free time, I would go off and do it myself. I think it's a place to do it. And, and, you know, it's funny you talk about, about this, about theory, right? Because I remember, I remember having a conversation with someone at a conference. I was like, they were like, what do you do? I'm like, well, I use theory to, um, uh, uh, to, to sort of try to design better online communities. And they were like, well, you don't use theory. <laughs> it was someone who sort of built theory for theory's sake. And so, so this idea of sort of using theory to try to do these things, right? I'm, I'm a big fan. Cool. Yeah, I would like to build a theory someday. So I, I'm going to give a much less uh, thoughtful comment, but I've just kind of been. That's okay. The beard makes up for it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I stroke my beard while I ask. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, Careful. You got, it looks like you got a little beard injury. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I get caught. In. Anyway, sorry. Um, so one of the things I guess I'm, and maybe I'm just. This has to do with being more precise about the definition of influence. I, I think my intuition is that often the way that uh, networks and these the social um, you know, cues influence uh, people to adopt and share things is because of exposure, actually, right? That is, it's a filtering effect, right? And so by gathering the, you know, the information from our networks, it's, we get stuff that's probably more relevant to us, right? And so I'm not sure to what extent you were able to kind of tease those out because you don't know in your data set, for example, what people were exposed to. And one concern that I have is that the, you could see really dominant effects of the really popular stuff that everybody loved, right? And that they were all exposed to it and that you kind of don't, that if you were to look at kind of more precise, is that what Carl said? A little bit. Okay, keep sorry. Going. I couldn't hear no, no, Carl. No, 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 but, 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 yeah. but keep going with this, right? Yeah, no, that, just that if you, if you looked at, again, I guess cases where um, people had less mainstream preferences or uh, things like that, if you could possibly see different effects. And so and it might be possible to actually just do some stuff with, with overall popularity. And maybe you did, I just wasn't entirely sure. Uh, that was the high level external exposure stuff where we suggested that this might, right? But you know, if you're really sort of thinking about a theory of how people pick items, mm -hmm. right? Then there's probably a whole bunch of processes, right? It's actually reminded of a paper that David Crandall went out on about how people choose which articles to edit and or who to talk to on Wikipedia. You have a certain probability of you know picking something based on randomly, right? Yeah, purely okay. randomly, something randomly based on popularity, something based on your preferences, something based on influence, right? And so I guess I would position this as is trying to at least apportion some of the decision making between what you want and what others do, mm -hmm. right? And that implicitly also captures some of these popularity effects, right? Because if we both do it because it's popular, Right, that should sort of average out in the wash because the non-friends will also do it because it's popular, right? And so it's implicit in the formulation, but it's not very explicit. Now the question is, there's another version of what you said, which is, um, another Mark Newman might actually call me on this question, right? Which is that actually this is a, you know, it's not really an independent cascade model at all that I do, right? I do have to, um, see the, the rainbow picture 11 times before I decide that it's safe in my network and interesting to me to decide to do that, right? And this is an explicit model that, and the reason why we chose this model this way was because we thought it was the model of how people sort of look at items, right? We didn't assume you had a memory for items, right? Uh, it might be that if you saw the same thing coming up over and over, you'd be more influenced. But we thought that for a lot of these feed-based systems, sort of processing it in the moment, sort of relatively casually, was 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 a better model, right? For for, for the kind of influence we're thinking about. I totally believe that there are other kinds, either other kinds of things, right? 
or an additional component to the grand unified theory that, that we count for. Right. Yeah, in the first study you presented, um, you discussed how individual preferences in terms of how individuals are influenced uh -huh. um, varies widely. Some people don't care what their friends think mm -hmm. about the movies, you know, mm -hmm. uh, other movies. Some people really do. Um, is that more of an individual uh, dependent condition, or is that more um, dependent on media? So, I don't know. There's probably no way to get at this in your second study because you couldn't match individuals across the different databases. Uh -huh. But I'd be curious what you would find if you were able to do that. Right. Some people like, always don't care. Yes. And some people care very much. Right. So, okay, so there's a notion, there's a general notion of trust in the world, right? And when people talk about trust, they usually talk about trust as being domain dependent, right? Sort of nuanced things, right? I trust actors to tell me about acting, and I couldn't care less what they think about sports. I'm actively hostile to what they say about politics, right? Because they don't know about those things, and I don't many more than I do, and so I don't particularly trust them, right? And so my what I would map your question onto is, do I trust other people more, or do I have more independent tastes in movies than I do in music? I don't know. It is a great question. It's not the most satisfying answer, but it's the right answer. Uh, last question? Okay, cool. It was a quick question. Yeah, I think so. Um, so <laughs> Talk really fast. <laughs> uh, sorry. Is <laughs>